What's up, this is Carlos Cruz of Warbringer, and we're here at West Valley Studios where we recorded our new album, Weapons of Tomorrow. Myself, Keevil, and Adam are here to give you a track-by-track -track breakdown of the music and lyrics of our new record. Each of these songs really came about in its own unique way. And on this video, we wanted to take you not just behind the actual material on the record, but behind our process and how we wrote it and how we work as a band. We're always very meticulous and we really want to give the listener a whole lot to sink their teeth into so they can listen to this album over and over again. And uh, this video is behind our process on each one of these 10 songs. So in this new album, we're taking a step further into the evolution of Warbringer musically. And after coming off the World of the Vanquished album, we have branched out the territories that we no longer fear, which has opened up new elements of what we can pull off in this album, which I think is going to blow you away. So the idea for this and the closing song both came from the same trip that I was on uh, during the Woe to the Vanquish tour, actually. Uh, my wife and I, we went to the Belgian town of Ypres, which used to be a uh, World War I battleground. And I had a lot of thoughts while I was there. And one of them that I had was just how deadly machines and weaponry was over a century ago. The original Maxim gun from 1897. 1897 could put out 600 rounds a minute. And that's that long ago. So what the kind of thought that implied to me is, it's been so long since then, where are we now and what's next? And that's where I kind of got the whole theme for the album title and this track. Uh, the title specifically comes from something that uh, a French general, Patton, said before the First World War began. And he said firepower kills. What did he mean by that? What he meant is that machines are so strong right now and so deadly that human bravery and heroism doesn't mean what it used to. And we already crossed that line over a century ago. Where are we heading tomorrow? That's kind of the core concept of the record and that's where it came from. So to actually bring this idea about, I had the existing chorus lines, the end of the song, and uh, some of the other lines in my head. And I also heard a few riffs. And so I had a very specific idea of how I wanted this to go, and the real idea was to start with a simple thrash riff and to have it evolve, kind of like it starts out like a rattly old machine gun, and by the end of the song, the riff's a jet fighter or a guided drone or something really modern or futuristic. Uh, to make this happen, we wanted to take this really simple riff and kind of have it evolve or tech up throughout the song. So this was the idea from the get-go. Now, how am I gonna bring this about, though? The only problem is I don't play guitar. So Kimo comes at me with this idea for a thrash metal song about evolving weaponry. He's got a title, it's called Firepower Kills. He's got the verse written, he's got the chorus written, uh, he had this outro refrain written, but no music. So I ask him, well, how do you hear the riff? So what he does have is rhythms, rhythm patterns anyway. So it was my task to take those rhythms and write riffs accordingly, so kind of write riffs underneath the lyrics and the vocal ideas he has. And we've worked like that before. We did that on the song Silhouettes on the last album. So he literally starts freaking out straight Beavis and Butthead just rhythming, mouthing the riffs to this tune. So then I have to write music accordingly. This is actually how we wrote these riffs. Dun 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 How firepower kills. And the end part went So now that we have the bulk idea for this song, it turns out to be a very more traditional, like 85 old school thrash metal number. And again, the music and the lyrics have to like coexist together. So in his mind, if the lyrics are going to tech up, so does the riff. So we have the you know clunky machine gun, old school way that the riff is played. And then throughout the song, you'll hear that it techs up and becomes more like today's modern drones. 
So I've known John 15 odd years, and uh, his mouth riffing has been a thing of the past. Uh, actually, when I started playing drums for Warbringer back in the day, the intro for Total War was a thing that he had said, you know, big, long Tom Phil. So I did quads, it worked. And then, uh, you know, we use it again for the second, third, fourth, fifth album. We still use it this day, whether he has to hum a rhythm section or he finds a couple notes or simple drumming on his knees. He gets it across to us and we make a riff out of it. At the end of the song, we repeat the album title a lot. We'll build a brighter future with the weapons of tomorrow. So this is sort of the title track and it really contains the album's theme. One thing a lot of Warbringer songs do structurally is after we finish our main verse chorus part, we'll go into an entirely new riff and take the ending of the song somewhere else. And we did that here too. Uh, we got that repeating phrase, we'll build a brighter future with the weapons of tomorrow, but I managed to put a bit of a sinister wordplay with a double meaning on the word bright, and I really love to do that whenever I can. Uh, it gives it this sense like it's a slick and evil commercial for the military industrial complex or something, and I really like writing evil kind of from its own perspective. This song came about just another night in my studio, riffing away. I knew I wanted something a little more direct, something similar to Remain Violent, but not that meat and potatoes kind of brick to the face. I wanted something a little different, a little more musical, a little more intricate, maybe a little bit more melodic. So I came up with this core riff. Uh, cool vibes, it kind of reminded me of late 80s, early 90s Slayer and the riff style. So it was different. So I had the main riff, and then the rest of the song, I just created variants of that main riff, whether it was different tails, different harmonies, different key changes, what have you. So again, this is gonna be that main riff, so consequently, the working title for this song was Riff Man. So Carlo shows me this demo called Riff Man, and uh, I really like it. It's beefy, it's mean, it's uh, catchy, I think. The uh, only problem is I get serious writer's block on this. I thought the title Riff Man was pretty funny, so the first line that comes to my head was, I am the Riff Man, you like riffs. And that's pretty stupid. So I couldn't use that, and I had to come up with something else, but I couldn't hear anything else but Riff Man every time I put the track on. So I had to get around that somehow and kind of jostle my own thinking out of writer's block. So one thing I latched onto in the riffs Carlos gave me is this kind of clandestine or sneaky, sinister feel. So I wanted the lyrics to reflect that. I happen to be reading this book, The Sleepwalkers, which among other things talks about the Franz Ferdinand assassination. And the organization behind that, they got the coolest name for a terrorist organization. They're called the Black Hand, commonly. Uh, the Black Hand themselves aren't the ones who did the assassination. They got these three other people, among which uh, was a 19-year-old Gavrilo Princip, to actually pull the trigger, shoot the Archduke, and start the war. Um, I thought this was really interesting because it's like the organization itself is using these young people as a pawn to carry out their will. And so I wanted to write the song from the angle of like the shadow order telling the agent what they're gonna do. So when my solo for Black Hand reaches out, I had some big shoes to fill because I was coming after Chase's solo, which is about a minute and a half of just awesome shreddery, uh, different styles of course, but uh, while sitting here, I had time to work it out. I hadn't written it yet, but I had the time in the studio to take about a half hour to an hour. Wrote it, filled up the gap, and it breaks up real nice, and I think it complements the song really well. And another cool thing about it is uh, when we did the video, which we'd never done before, we had actually acted 
So Carlos, John, and myself got to dress up as the conspirators and uh, portray a really cool little bit of acting scene, which you'll see in the music video. And I got to tap into my inner assassin role. Working title for this number is Death Trash, coming from this Death Thrash, you know, late 80s, early 90s, extreme thrash metal hybrid mixed with death metal. Some of our favorite influences like Demolition Hammer or Devastation, uh, core influences on this song for sure. So I ended up coming up with this really heavy riff that became the core of all the song and I built the rest of the song around it. So go something like this. So on this one, unlike Black Hand, when I got the riffs from Carlos, I knew pretty much exactly what I was gonna do with it. That main lurching riff just really put a certain image in my mind, which is that of a, a tank kind of rolling over a mountain of skulls. Some very good old death metal feelings there. I like it, a good starting point. So instead of having a literal tank rolling over fragile humans, I was thinking, what if that's a metaphor for kind of what's going on in the world and society? Yeah, you know, kind of unstoppable forward technological progress and how when something's invented, people don't say, what's it gonna do? They just make it and everyone has to deal with the consequences. You know, like AI, automation, mass labor force displacement, uh, mass surveillance societies, all of that wonderful stuff that we all have to live with now um, that puts the future into uncertainty. So I kind of made it a thing about strong, futuristic, powerful machines versus weak humans. And uh, that fit the theme of the record really well. And also that word crush really just sounds like a crushing riff. So I liked it on that level as well. And it gives me a good excuse to go crush at the end of the song. So John comes back to me with the lyrics he now has and the concept of this whole song. And my original demo had this outro riff that was fast. Didn't really fit the music, so we dropped it. So we took the main riff, put it at the end, and literally just that, we wanted to um, create the visual of a tank just fucking rolling over anything in its path just off into the distance. Working title for this song is Colts, spelled KBLT. I had the core ideas for this song for quite some time. Didn't know what to do with them. I wanted to write something for myself. I knew it wasn't written for Warbringer, that's for damn sure, but I wrote it, I demoed it, and I sent it to John, and he really liked it. So I knew for sure the, the most striking part of it was this great melody that I ended the song with, but I ended up starting the song with it and go something like this.
So this was something new for Warbringer, was the dynamic we hadn't explored in a sense of song by using clean guitars, acoustic guitars in the verses. You know, it felt good, it felt, uh, it was cold. You know, it resonated with me and I, it was something I wanted to pursue and, and challenge uh, myself, challenge our band, challenge our fans uh, with a new dynamic. So it was these really somber verses that led into this big fucking roaring guitar chorus. So the song takes a turn. You know, the first half is very somber and melodic, and then it just takes a right turn where I get to exercise my affinity for black metal. Uh, a main influence for myself, Keevil, and Adam is Bathory. So I definitely brought that across, and this second half has this great triumphant rise, uh, both in his lyrics and what he's saying, both in the music because it just keeps growing and building and building as it fades out with this fantastic guitar harmony that has multiple layers. And when John started writing up the lyrics to it, I, this great line um, that wrote at the very end, it said, Defiance of Fate, so I decided to call the song Defiance of Fate. So for this one, Carlos hands me the uh, KVLT demo and he says, Hey man, I don't know what you want to do with this. I wrote some shit in the middle of the night. I was high. He hands it to me, and it's really different for us. It has a, a soft first part, and we've never done that. It's, uh, I really loved the music though, so I wanted to do it. But it's a challenge for me, because my whole vocal style is tailored around basically going ballistic, and here's a part of the bit of music we wrote where I can't do that. So I have to come up with a workaround and a new way to use my voice. So what I really liked about this song is how it was a real two-part song. It felt really epic, and I love the way it, build, it just builds up and builds up. It was a challenge for me, but I ended up uh, going with, I was gonna do the search for meaning as a theme. And the idea is I could do, I could match the two parts of music in the song with a two-part lyric that uses two different vocal styles. So the idea was to have a theme of despair and nihilism in the first half, and sort of an existential triumph where the speaker creates meaning at the end. So with that two-part song thing in mind, I decided I was gonna do the first half really bleak and forlorn and despairing, but then the speaker in the second half decides that he's not gonna accept a nihilistic outlook for himself, and he's gonna pretty much raise his fist and create his own meaning and burn his flame bright. So I use this phrase in the first half, a silent dark, to talk about sort of an empty black place you might go after you die where there's nothing and the fear of that. But then at the end, it's the phrase is turned to, I will not go silently into the dark, where it's about burning your flame bright, creating a meeting and uh, a legacy. And so I think it turned out really powerful to match the music. And I use a dynamic where the nihilistic forlorn part is in this uh, distant black metal delivery that I've never done before. And the end part is in my uh, signature boisterous delivery that I usually use. So I think it's a really unique song in the discography and uh, pushing myself as a vocalist and a lyricist in this way uh, to match what Carlos was doing that was out of the box gave us some great results. When I first joined the band, the extent of my songwriting was more so helping out with the structures, and then it was cool to see my particular influence develop on songs like Echoes from the Void or Hunter Seeker uh, into a song like this. So um, it's a good feeling to know that from just the drummer, I've now become you know core composer with John and Adam, and that they are open-minded enough and willing enough to take a chance, take a risk with something new like Defiance of Fate.
So this one actually was the first one we did for the record and the oldest that we had. Uh, I had this title kicking around in my head since 2013, and the basic concept was to have a hyper-fast, chaotic thrash song called Unraveling with the theme of suicide. And not suicide in a, the tragic or the mournful sense, but really just trying to capture sort of the horror and how scary it is to be in the midst of all that emotion and to have uh, the speaker kind of consumed by it. So I wanted this song to just be horrifying, intense, and scare the hell out of the listener. This is the first song I wrote for the record. And I just had this barrage of just savage, fast, wicked riffs. They went well together, you know, so I was able to have all these crazy twists and turns, these different moods, but it was all about the speed. And the first half of the tune was only about maybe a minute and a half. I demoed it and I sent it to John. Uh, he came back with the title, Unraveling. Fit perfectly. So we took that, and what ended up happening was to write the second half of the song, we needed contrast to the front half. So instead of speed, I took the verse riff, modified it a little bit, and we ended up with this crushing outro section, refrain, really powerful stuff. The main challenge for me in doing this one was in tracking, just getting all the enunciation and the syllables just right, because some of the delivery in the middle of this song is so goddamn fast, even for me, which I like to do fast vocals. There's also a really, really ugly and just grotesque sounding four-tracked scream in the middle that's something pretty new and goes far into death metal territory, I would say. And as well, there's kind of a thematic connection between this and Defiance of Fate, and this is why we put them after one after the other on the record. First off, if anyone was worried, we went soft on that last song. This one's extremely brutal. And second, in Defiance of Fate, the singer overcomes his depression and his emotion, but on unraveling, he succumbs to it and he loses. This song was compiled mainly from a lot of riffs that I had in the banks from a long time ago. A lot of the composition was done through Carlos and arrangements with Keeble. And sometimes it works better that way. You know, we're both drummers, so my background from that, I have full trust in him to take this stuff and make it what it is. And it ended up being one of the longest songs on the record, but it doesn't feel like it. It's a beast of a song. My working title for this track was called Dark Harmony. And I was up late one night, having a few drinks, Iron Maiden documentary in the background, riffing around on bass, so I wrote this bass line and added, ended up adding a guitar harmony over it. You'll now hear that in the middle of the song. It only repeats once or so. But uh, in order to continue writing, I went through Adam's vault of riffs, found something pretty fitting, and now that became the main theme of the song. It became the main riff, it had the right uh, melodic sensibilities, it was dark, it was brooding, uh, it was in a waltz time, so I took that. You'll now hear that as the bass intro, it becomes the main riff of the song, so that's the front end of the song. Knowing that that occupied a lot of time, I felt the middle of the tune needed to go somewhere else. So we went into more of an extreme, kind of crushing, 
uh, breakdown, if you will. From that point on, went into uh, more of an extended solo lead guitar section with a barrage of different riffs, and then we found our way back into it. So when I got handed the music for Heart of Darkness, what I had was something really dark, blackened, brooding, and really long. Uh, I wanted to do something serious and heavy for this, and I happened to be in my finishing up my bachelor's studies for my history degree. And what I one thing I was learning about was world colonialism, and I learned specifically about the Belgian Congo, which is just a gallery of unbelievable horror. And I also read the novel Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, which is this real ugly, deeply racist book, but it really talks about colonialism and its evil kind of from within its own perspective. So there's a lot to unpack there that I won't go into, but I wanted to do a song with this as the theme because what I think is that this era in the world leaves a really long shadow on today. And a lot of the stuff people are upset about or talking about today has roots back in this time. Uh, so I wanted to do a song about that and also a song about kind of the evil in men's souls and the question of what makes it so people will try to dominate and rule and subjugate other people. Because I think that the real ugly answer is because they can and it's good for them. Uh, to spice up the musical side of the song, one thing I thought that I was adamant about from the beginning is that the bass was going to have a heavy role in this. Because the guitar stays on this like waltz time tremolo line a lot and I wanted the bass to kind of dance around it. One thing in the book Heart of Darkness, they have this metaphor of the, the river going up into the Heart of Darkness, and there's a couple movies that get that idea across. I handed these movies off, uh, Apocalypse Now and Aguirre, The Wrath of God, to our bassist Chase Bryant, and I told him, make your bass line sound like the river. And what we get is something really like meandering and murky, and it really dances around the guitar line. So here, this was using a visual aid to give a different member an image that I had so he could realize it in his own way. And that was a cool element to the writing of this song, and I think it really adds a lot to the final piece. So even though a lot of the riffs from Heart of Darkness came from old material that I had, uh, once I handed it over to Carlos, he really kind of confined it into an actual compositional piece that ended up being over seven minutes and I think our lengthiest song on the album. Uh, it turned out killer. So this is the first piece of music I wrote post Woe to the Vanquished, and I wanted something direct, something that slammed, something that made you want to move. Uh, around that time I was listening to a lot of different bands, anything from like early Chromex to Violence, and um, that really played a role in the type of riffs I was writing, so I really like the dynamic this song has with the tight chug riffs to the open blaring chords in the chorus. And instead of going fast, uh, we ended up going with a breakdown to wrap up this number and every time we play it live it just absolutely crushes.
So while we were writing this one, uh, the president said something that I thought just had to be a thrash metal lyric. He said, uh, he's talking about North Korea, and he said, they will be met by a fire and a fury unlike anything the world has seen before. I'm like, well, that sounds evil. I'm using that. Thank you for writing my lines for me. Um, what I wanted to get at with this, remember in the, fir the first song how we were talking about how scary modern weapons have, come, have become and how far it's gone. Now think of that power being all held by one person, and this person, no matter who he is, is an emotional creature who can be irrational and could do things for dumb, personal, petty reasons. And so that was kind of the angle I wanted in this song, is the idea of the power of the modern state behind a proud, vain human. And this really comes across in the end where the speaker of the song is saying over and over, I will be second to none. What I want the image that the listener gets for that is kind of a guy with his hand on the button saying, don't push in me, don't question me, I'll do it. So with the song Power and Surpass, that was a single we'd released shortly after the Lord of the Vanquished album. And uh, we had it out just for content. And once we started to do the new mixes for the album, we realized how good it sounded. We put that in there with it and it ended up sounding tenfold better. So that's going on in the new album as well. All right, for these next two songs, uh, we took the more organic approach. Uh, I went over to Carlos's garage. He said it was drum kit, I set up my guitar rig, and then I just started busting out some uh, maniacal chainsaw riffs. So once we got the bare bones of the song basically structured, uh, last minute, Thing that we introduced was just this random heavy riff that I made on the spot and it ended up being one of the most crushing riffs on the album I think. Out of reaches. It was a cool garage jam. Adam and I just in there burning it up. You have these riffs that just reminded me of like old Sodom. And uh, yeah, you know, we take breaks. You want to smoke break, having some drinks, whatever. Open the uh, garage door, get some air. And there was a wasp just like hovering around, literally. You know, the riffs were kind of buzzy. Uh, our engineer, our audio engineer, front of house in Europe, fucking Bob, he says wasp. Working title. So Adam and Carlos passed me this WASP demo from a garage jam they did, and I didn't know what to do with it for a while. I heard a pretty fast, aggressive track. I've written a lot of these in my day, and I want something new to do with it. Carlos kept saying, man, you don't need to overthink it. You can write something just like kind of straightforward. It doesn't need to be this involved concept, but uh, I'm me, so it does. And here's what I ended up coming up with. I gravitated towards a couple musical parts in there that suggested something no one else was hearing in the song, which was outer space. And the parts that led me to that, there's this tremolo riff that I thought sounded kind of soaring and gave me a rocket ship kind of uh, image in my head. And then this really dense and heavy middle riff that I was like, oh, that's just like you get sucked into a black hole. And so I really went with that black hole thing. Uh, so the song became this sort of sci-fi story about explorers who are fleeing a dying earth in the future and they're gonna go dive through the black hole and see what's on the other side. Um, and once we decided this as the theme, that colored the writing for a lot of the top musical layers, stuff like the lead guitar, the note choice became very alien in space, and uh, in the middle part, this black hole section, we put these like groaning guitar noises and stuff on the drum production to make it sound like space-time distorted when we get to that part. And so it really 
makes it uh, a cool image, and I think that that really separates this fast burner of a song from the many fast burners that Warbringer has written. So in the same jam session, the same day as Outer Reaches, we wrote the song Notre Dame slash King of Fools, uh, which stemmed from a lot of riffs that I had in the key of A that I just never used. And then uh, once I made this little acoustic neoclassical intro, we put that in the beginning and everything else just kind of fell into place and it worked out really well. So then after our intro, like a bat out of hell, it just kicks into this. And a lot of the song actually uses a lot of my uh, melodic death metal influences as I mentioned before, which gives this one a real bleak and brooding kind of feel through it. It's very, uh, very gothic and at times very jovial. So uh, it's a fun one. It turned out really, really awesome for what Carlos and I were accomplished in a day. This was the only other one written in the garage. Adam had a great set of riffs in A. Uh, didn't know what to do with them exactly, so we sat there, grinded it out, and just structured it together. Uh, on breaks, um, on the news everywhere, it was the day that the cathedral was burning, so we titled it Notre Dame and stuck with it. So in other songs, usually when I have this many riffs, I give them to Carlos and he does the arrangements. Um, for this one, how it was done organically, we did it in the garage, and how it turned out in the garage ended up on the album exactly as. And um, for the lyrical content for this one, I'm a huge fan of the book, Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo, and the film with Charles Lawton. So one night, uh, I had Keeble watch it, and we just started spinning ideas about the uh, themes between how he was treated in that film to get the vibe of what you're going to hear in the lyrical ideas for uh, Notre Dame and the line made of stone. So I get handed this jam called Notre Dame and what it is is something long, melodic, kind of gothic sounding and very brooding and a little blackened. Uh, Adam also really wanted his arrangement to shine through here as he made it. So I was working very much off of his ideas here. Uh, what we decided on, we decided to keep the Notre Dame theme because we thought that that was recent and powerful. And where we went to with it was the, the story, the hunchback of Notre Dame and Quasimodo and such. So that's why we have the two-part title, Notre Dame, King of Fools. And the King of Fools part is kind of where uh, there's sort of three speakers. And the first speaker is the crowd mocking the Quasimodo figure, basically telling him the world will never accept you. You're not like us, you freak. Go back to the tower you came from and uh, sort of like this evil jester mocking him. And there's some King Diamond-esque evil psychotic laughter in there too. The second part is where Quasimodo flees from the mocking crowd. He goes and seeks sanctuary in the cathedral and he's talking to a gargoyle and he, he envies the gargoyle because it can't feel pain like he can. And he says to it, why am I not made of stone? And I managed to get that line in the song, which I was very happy about. Then we go to this third part where it's, we're outside of the Hunchback story, and now we're, sent, we're looking at the cathedral and all the stories it's seen. This is just one of them. And we're kind of musing and thinking about its loss and what that means. And so I kind of tied these different themes together, and they're not directly connected so much in the song. Uh, from where we go from the story to the cathedral burning, there's a musical separation there. And, uh, but I think they really tie together and it just felt emotionally right for me to put there. So I put it there and it's a very uh, 
multifaceted song that goes to themes of uh, personal isolation and loss, uh, as well as musings on history and legacy. So this last song, Glorious End, was really my personal pet project on the record. It comes from the same trip where I wrote Firepower Kills, I was in the town of Ypres, and something kind of crazy happened that day where I was there and I found the grave of a man who has my last name that I didn't know about before, who died precisely a hundred years before I was there standing there. So that got me feeling really somber and reflective and something I can't quite even describe. And what I started thinking about was all the sort of uh, what they'd say is pointless sacrifice in World War I or just any time, but all the futile failed assaults where men just charge bravely into the teeth of machine guns and get cut to ribbons and for what? And that just makes me so deeply sad to think about and I really wanted to put that into a song. So the way I decided to get this idea across was as a conversation between a father and son. And it's not about the battle itself, but it's about what the soldier does to prepare himself mentally for the battle, what goes through his head. And the way I've written this is it's the son saying to the father, I will be brave, I'll do my duty. When the time comes, I will not turn tail and run. And the father's there talking back to his son, reinforcing these same heroic and brave virtues. Um, the chorus line I had, which is identical to what I came up with years before the song ever existed, is, For I am no coward, I will laugh at death again, now onward, my brothers, to our glorious end. And I thought that that was pretty powerful, and I, um, I wanted to write kind of in a pre-modern sort of way, like in romantic-sounding 19th century poetic lingo. I thought that has a certain power from it, like it comes from the past, from the era of knights and dragons, and not from the era of, you know, machine guns and jets and such. Um, so I thought that that was a really powerful angle to go with it, and I thought that this way of writing had a really strong emotional component. Uh, the concept behind the end verse, which existed verbatim how it is three years ago, um, is that for the first part of the song, it's the soldier and the father preparing him mentally for battle. At the end of the song, the soldier finally goes into battle, the moment he's been waiting for, but as soon as it happens, he is killed arbitrarily, pointlessly and cruelly. And then he, as he dies, he goes, what was the meaning of my sacrifice? All those virtues I believed in, was that all a lie? Did my father lie to me? What was that for? And he leaves the question unanswered and on a note of deep uh, questioning and pain. And I think it's a hell of a way to the end, end the album and it really gets that feeling I had in my heart out onto record in a way I can't quite explain beyond saying listen to the song. Uh, I'm really proud of how this came out and I think that this is something that's very distinct towards my style of writing in our band. You aren't gonna hear this from other bands that talk about war today. I think they do tend to do a lot more flag waving and stuff and I don't think that's the real truth of it. I want a song that looked on a psychological and an emotional level at the really human psychological side because every person who's a number on these giant World War casualty lists was a real person that went from womb to tomb just like you and I. Yeah, so Kivo came at me with that. Hell of a concept. Uh, an idea he's really passionate about. And it's my job to convey that through music, you know, a really powerful heavy metal song. So yeah, it was cool, he showed me different mediums uh, in order to express that idea and he showed me a movie called Gallipoli, a couple of different scenes from that that dealt with a father and son and had this tragic ending. So I went into Adam's vault of riffs and Adam just has a knack for writing these really melodic and rich riffs. 
So I took a few of them that I felt went well together, and the verse ended up being sung from the perspective of the son and the bridge from the perspective of the father. So I was able to tie that in as well, and it works really well. So I took Adam's riffs and made them the verse and the bridge, and then I came up with a chorus and post-chorus. All right, guys, so that's all the songs off Weapons of Tomorrow. As you can see, a lot of work and creativity went into this one, and I'm very proud of it. And I can't wait for you guys to get a chance to listen to it and check it out. The working relationship with this band allows everybody to bring in their own personal musical influences and ideas to create a greater Warbringer. And the fact that we have five different personalities with an eclectic taste in music, different backgrounds, uh, keeps this fresh. You know, I'm, I champion the fact that we have a variety in the songwriting, but more so the willingness to collaborate, try a different approach uh, to create these songs. Uh, definitely keeps this fresh six albums in. We are all extremely proud of this record. We put a lot of work into this and a lot of thought and detail, and we really wanted to show you guys everything that we're thinking and everything we put into this record. We want to give you guys something that you can listen to 100, 200, 300 times and still not be sick of it, still find new things to enjoy and new connections to make. I hope you'll uh, check out this video again when you have the record in your hands so you can kind of see everything we're talking about firsthand and really dig into it. Thank you all for watching. This has been The Science of Thrash. Keep your eyes peeled for Weapons of Tomorrow the new 21st century state-of-the-art in thrash metal.